little bit about myself uh, just before we get started. So I work as a freelance consultant. I handle a whole bunch of uh, products uh, related to Microsoft stack. So I primarily work on .NET, uh, on Azure, and also do a little bit of Angular development. Uh, so I offer uh, CTO services, architect services, developer services, whatever you need. Uh, I sort of handle that myself. Uh, one of my uh, hobby uh, is like building uh, what we call micro SaaS or indie SaaS, small applications built by one or two people, and that scale incre scale out incredibly well. So this talk is going to be about Cloud Skew, which is an online diagram editor. And at three o'clock. I have a talk on the Quiz Hub application as well. So, uh, and I'll be doing a deep dive into both of these. Uh, okay. So, uh, I've been working in the, as a consultant for the last five years, but prior to that, I used to work at Microsoft. So, I had a journeyman career there, worked in a couple of different teams uh, .NET, uh, Visual Studio, Windows Server, and Azure Cloud. Uh, but after that, I've been sort of uh, been uh, out on my own. Uh, my Twitter handle, I'm pretty active on Twitter. Uh, it's Mithun Shanbag. So feel free to uh, follow me on Twitter. Send me a, a connect request on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, happy to connect. All right. So what is Cloud Skew? So it's a, like I said, it's an online diagramming editor. You can draw flow charts. You can draw module diagrams. You can uh, use it to draw AWS, Azure, GCP, Kubernetes, Alibaba Cloud, IBM Cloud. Uh, whatever uh, you know, uh, cloud architecture diagrams you need to draw, you can draw it with Cloud Skew. All the icons are built in there. It's free. Uh, the first couple of diagrams are free. After that, it's paid. <laughs> uh, so I have almost 120k plus users. So uh, of course, not all of them are daily active users. Nobody draws diagram on a daily basis. Um, so uh, before I dive into the details, uh, just a quick disclaimer that. Uh, there are some things that I may not be able to uh, do a full deep dive into uh, for patent reasons and for compete reasons. So I'll hold off on those details. But other than that, I'm going to dive in. Okay, uh, We have a bit of a logical, uh, uh, logistical challenge. So we will not be able to do the demo. Uh, but let me quickly talk about the, uh, you know, uh, so this is a, what we call a micro SaaS or indie SaaS application, small teams that have to build out applications that scale to hundreds and thousands of users. So the playbook is completely different um, from a tra what a traditional enterprise application looks like. right? So the first rule of thumb is we have to go with PaaS services or serverless components and not manage our own infrastructure. So we cannot uh, you know, reserve capacity. Our usages, uh, or if you look at our workloads, they are very spiky in nature. People can come draw a diagram. There's no fixed time of drawing a diagram. You can, you know, people draw uh, at any time, uh, and we have a ge uh, geographically distributed audience. So we don't want to reserve capacity for servers. We don't want to reserve capacity for compute or storage. So we just want to pay as you go. So that's uh, number one. Second thing is, uh, I don't want any server management overhead. I don't want to maintain a VM. I don't want to maintain a Kubernetes cluster. I don't want to maintain a, a container registry, none of that. So uh, I want to use all uh, serverless components. I want to use uh, managed uh, instances. Uh, other rule of thumb. Uh, how to prefer mono, uh, microservices over monoliths. And uh, this is primarily because we have a whole bunch of components. Everything is, uh, we've, uh, you know, it's, we use the microservice paradigm here. So we want to scale out and deploy the components individually. So with a monolith, uh, you know, the serv uh, your servers, web servers, and databases go together. So you have to deploy them together. We don't want to do that. We want to deploy them independently. So which is why we uh, prefer microservices. Um, Another rule of thumb is we have to be uh, very rapid in our iteration. So we have the time from the time we think up of a feature, uh, we have to release it very fast. So it has to go from ideation to development to deployment to release in a you know very quick cadence. Um, it's okay if the UI is not you know perfectly aesthetic. It's okay to ship that. This is the whole uh, concept of an MVP or a prototype, right? 
So um, it's okay if the UI doesn't have a polish. The customers don't care. They will live with the rough edges as long as they find the product usable and the product gets the job done. So releasing frequently. Okay. Uh, other thing about this is uh, the uh, releasing frequently means you have to do deployments. And uh, we, you don't have a large team. You don't have a DevOps team here. It's just two people or just one person uh, most of the time. So you have, to be, uh, you have to bake in all the telemetry and monitoring. Your system has to tell you what the health of the system is. So this means things like adding health checks, alerts, monitoring, uh, dashboards, all those stuff. So, uh, and we also invest heavily in CI CD pipeline. So the whole goal is to make deployments very fast. So from the time you check into your main branch, it has to go to production you know, in as short a time span as possible, sometimes like within minutes. So uh, we invest a lot in uh, infrastructure, a CI CD pipeline. And uh, another rule is no premature optimizations. Like, don't solve problems that you don't have yet, right? So uh, I only have 120K odd users. I don't have millions of users. So there is no point you know, over investing in a Kubernetes cluster or an ingress controller or horizontal pod autoscaler. Those are problems I would love to have. I don't have them yet. So I'll postpone them for the future. OK. All right. So this is what the tool looks like. Okay, so this is a diagram drawn from the tool. Unfortunately, I can't give a demo uh, today be, uh, because of the logistical uh, reasons. But this is what the tool uh, more or less do. It's a drag and drop editor. You can drag icons from a palette onto the canvas. You can adjust its properties. So you can make a, you know you can change the colors. You can change the uh, type fonts and all those things. And you can draw and print diagrams like these. Go back, back, back. Okay, so um, so this diagram is also the architecture of Cloud Skew. Okay, um, so let, let's do a deep dive. Let's look at all the components. Um, you know, th so it's the journey starts here from the DNS layer. So when you type in. Uh, www.cloudskew.com or app.cloudskew.com. We have a DNS zone, and we have a whole bunch of CNAME records that translate that Z, uh, DNS uh, uh, entry into the CDN endpoint, right? So, and then we have a CDN layer. So, the CDN, uh, so your uh, all your queries hit the CDN layer, Azure CDN, and then um, the CDN uh, basically the uh, endpoints will talk to an origin. And the origins are all storage accounts. Okay? So, so, so we have two major applications there. So one is the landing page, and the other is the actual diagram editor itself. Right? Uh, www is the landing page, and app dot is the, um, uh, is the actual uh, editor application. So the landing page is made with Vue, uh, Vuepress. It's a static uh, landing page. Uh, the application itself is developed with Angular and TypeScript. Okay? So all of this is served out of a storage account with static hosting. So similar to how you would host a, a React or Angular application out of an S3 bucket, we do the same thing here with a storage account. Um, there are other a whole bunch of static assets as well. So this is a diagram editor, a whole bunch of icons and SVG files. So all of them are also placed in uh, a storage account. And uh, customers can upload their own images. So in your own diagram, if you find that the icon doesn't exist, you can you know, insert your own uh, icon or you can insert your own image. So those user-uploaded images also go into the uh, storage account. So they are not served out directly, so they are served out through the CDN. So the advantage there uh, you get is uh, caching. Uh, you're caching at regional pops. Uh, compression, it compresses it up to 40% of its original size. Then you have uh, free TLS managed certs. And then you have rewriting rules as well, which help with the cache control headers and things like that. So that is, in a nutshell, is the front end. Okay? Now, uh, from the time the user uh, uh, enters the URL in the browser, uh, it goes to the DNS, goes to the CDN, and then serves out the HTML, JavaScript, CSS, all the static images. 
loads it in your browser. Now, at this point, the browser, uh, you know, the application in the browser takes over. Now, the next thing that happens is authentication. So we use Auth0 for it. Uh, so we have any, you can sign in with uh, LinkedIn, you can sign in with GitHub, or you can sign in with the, uh, your email address. There is no passwords there, you get an OTP email to you, and then you just enter that on the screen and then uh, you're inside the app. So um, we use uh, authorization code grant for this. Uh, so ID and access tokens are generated and they are validated at the server side. So now let's come to the back end. So these components are the front end. In the middle sits Auth0, which is the uh, identity provider. And then we have um, the back end. So the very first thing, the Cloud SKU APIs is just a CRUD wrapper over all the diagrams, diagram templates. So let's say you're modifying a diagram or you're deleting a diagram, all that CRUD application, CRUD uh, goes through the Cloud SKU APIs. There are some uh, specialized APIs to help you print and export the diagram. So you want to export that diagram to a PNG or SVG. So we have to do specialized things like WebKit rendering or uh, font smoothing. So all those things happen there. Um, then we have an arbitrary um, thing called CloudSQ helper for ad hoc things, like you want to resize and create a thumbnail. So generally, when you draw a diagram, and then the next time you come back, you want to see a thumbnail of that diagram on your, uh, on your uh, landing page there or on your uh, profile page there. So all those uh, resizing uh, thumbnails, all that is done by the CloudSQ helper. So um, all the back end is done in uh, .NET Core. Um, now it's, I've migrated uh, uh, all of them to .NET Core 6. Um, the CloudSQ helper is a Azure function. The other two are uh, app services in, a, uh, in two separate app service plan. And the reason they are in separate app service plan is because the print helper has a high memory footprint. So when you, uh, you know, print large diagrams, so uh, it tends to elevate the, uh, consume a lot of uh, working set memory, and it tends to recycle the app service. So I've isolated that into a separate app service plan. Um, Next, let's talk about the key vault, right? Uh, all the application configuration goes into the key vault. So things like your database, uh, pass, uh, your passwords, database connection strings, everything uh, is in key vault. So as soon as the uh, back end is deployed and when it wakes up, the very first thing it does is talks to the key vault and says, hey, uh, give me the connection strings. Let me go connect up to the database. So gets the connection strings, and then um, it connects up to three uh, things, right? It connects up to the service bus, it connects up to the uh, SQL Azure, and it connects up to the Cosmos DB. Now, why do we need that service bus component in there? And that is because um, when you, so we have an autosave functionality. And when you are autosaving a diagram, we are sending a burst of requests. So let's say you drag an icon across the canvas. So this is going to generate a burst of requests. And um, if we start uh, processing each request individually, it's going to overwhelm the database. So instead, what we do is we queue up. This is a pattern called queue-based load leveling. So we queue up all the requests in service bus. And uh, uh, then we dequeue them in batches. And uh, the batch size is tuned such that it can handle, uh, the database can handle that batch size. So then we uh, uh, dequeue it, and all the right commits happen through the uh, queue-based load leveling system. So uh, all the metadata, user profiles, all go into SQL Azure, while the actual diagram itself is JSON, goes into Cosmos DB. And uh, even with Cosmos DB, we don't have any uh, provision throughput or no reserved capacity. It's, we are using the serverless uh, flavor. So. That is the this thing. And then we have other components. So obviously, we have a, a telemetry dashboard. We have alerts set up. We have, um, uh, uh, like, uh, we heavily telemetrize all of our applications. So both the front end and back end, all the user metrics, all the system metrics are dumped into App Insights. So anything that is happening in the application, I come to know about it. Uh, then, OK, let's talk about the DevOps piece as well, right? So uh, deployment is pretty simple. Uh, so we use Azure repos and Azure pipelines. So uh, the, all the provisioning, right, the setup of this entire infrastructure is done with Terraform. That's a one-time thing. And then um, 
uh, we have git uh, we have these uh, uh, pipeline tasks which will you know uh, do automated deployment so let's say you add a feature to the application we just need to push it out so front end it's pretty straightforward we just do uh, you know the ng build dash prod package it up and uh, push it into the uh, storage container uh, for back end things get a little interesting so the print helper api that i mentioned it uses a whole bunch of app get packages so which means that i can't use a zip push I have to containerize the actual application. So uh, on commit to the main branch, uh, we do we build out the images, Docker images, push it to ACR, the container registry. And the container registry then has a webhook to all those app services. So uh, uh, every time there is a new push with the latest tag, uh, these things will pull down that image and do a self-deployment. So that is the architecture at a high level. Now let's. Go to the next. Uh, okay. So uh, let me talk a little bit about the high-level strategy, right? Um, uh, why I chose all these patterns. So why microservices, right? So like I said, there are a whole bunch of components, and I want all of them to be independently deployed and be independently scaled out. Sorry. Uh, so uh, next thing is why serverless and paths instead of infrastructure. Um, a, I don't want to maintain a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, it's a very small team. Uh, the built-in defaults for all the path services, I'm fine with that. And mainly for, mainly for auto-scaling reasons, right? Uh, when I provision VMs, now uh, if I need to scale it out, I have to worry about a load balancer, I have to worry about scale sets. Uh, I don't want to do any of that. I just wanted to horizontally auto scale out based on the load and then scale back in when the load disappears. So I let the pass layer take care of that. So some principles. Um, so one of the uh, rules of thumb is always use one repository per app, right? So you saw that there were a bunch of applications. There, on the front end, there, are, there is a landing page, there is a diagram editor itself. On the back end, there is a print helper, there is a uh, the actual CRUD APIs. So a bunch of applications are there. So we sort of split all of them out into multiple repos. So the idea is always deploy to test and prod from the same repo. Test and prod will always be identical, only the application configuration will change. So for example, your database connection strings might change, but the, uh, in the key vault, the key names remain the same, the values differ. So that way we split out the uh, application and its configuration. So deploying to test and prod from different repositories is always a bad idea. Always deploy from the same repository. Just use different configuration values. Okay, It's a bad idea to use one repository for all applications. Um, similarly, for package management, like multiple applications, uh, we need to share code somehow. So we do that through NuGet packages or NPM packages for the front end. So uh, we want to avoid code duplication. Um, yep. Okay. So one of the uh, uh, challenges with this is like uh, you don't want to auto roll forward to the latest version of the NuGet package that might be breaking changes. So we use semantic versioning. So we always, uh, to just to be safe, we pin it, uh, pin the package version. So that way, you know, uh, if you are on the minor or the build, uh, if that increments, there is no breaking change. It's fine to roll forward. But if there is a change from, let's say, 7.1 to 8.1, at that point, you don't want to roll forward. You want to pin it back to 7.1. So uh, we use semantic versioning there. OK, um, for controllability, right? Like I talked about how it's necessary or uh, how it's why it's essential to uh, separate the application uh, and its configuration, right? So always keep the configuration separate from the application. It's a bad idea to uh, couple them together, and especially because putting in things like passwords, connection strings inside source code is a terrible idea. And GitHub will flag that uh, for you. Uh, so don't put things like keys, account keys, and uh, uh, host name, and all that in there. So store that in a key vault or app config if you need to. Key vault because you know it's possible to R back it. So uh, we prefer key vault. Access policies can be explicitly set. So key vault uh, sounds like a great uh, solution for that. Um, from the same uh, this thing, uh, code base, we are deploying to dev, test, and prod. So each application will 
you know, read the configuration values from key vault. So we have three key vaults, one in dev, one in test, one in prod. So the key names all remain the same. The values differ. So in the prod, you will pro point to the prod database or have the prod connection string. In test, you will have the test connection string. Okay. And uh, obviously, you have to R back it. Uh, so that you know, uh, if you're working in dev, your user identity or your uh, user principle has access. When you're running in test or prod, it's the application's managed identity that has access. So you have to R back it accordingly. You can set access policies for it. Okay. So next one is, uh, uh, now what is the application's responsibility? We talked about configuration, but what is the application's responsibility? So when you deploy an application, uh, generally it's considered a bad idea if after deploying the application, the application doesn't start right up. Uh, you know, you invoke the entry point. Okay, thanks. So it's always a, a bad idea if after deployment you have to manually massage the application to get it started and configured, right? So the idea is you always want to have self-bootstrapping microservices. You just deploy it, invoke the entry point, and the application should figure out how to get itself up which key vault to read, which key vault endpoint to go hand check with, how to authenticate against it, all of that should be figured out by the application. Okay? So the app should know how to start itself up. The, so I use this pattern called key vault configuration provider. So what it does is it takes the key vault secrets and then overlays them on top of the configuration. So you generally dependency inject in the i configuration in all your ASP.NET uh, core applications and function applications. So just from that i configuration, now you, after using the configuration provider, you can access the key vault secrets as well. So it makes it very simple to use in your applications. So one of the things about uh, uh, the self-bootstrapping pattern is applications, they know how to start. They have to uh, start fast. But if something is wrong, say the key vault is down or you know, something else is down, the network connection is down, whatever, it has to you know, gracefully shut down, and it has to shut down with enough information uh, in the logs. So remember, we are executing serverless workloads here. So there is no server to log into or no server to SSH into. So logs are all you have. So be as verbose as you can uh, in those logs. So if your application is shutting down or gracefully shutting down, Mention you know, why it's shutting down. Have a very detailed, verbose exception message, whatever. Okay. Um, next, all these microservices, um, they need to be coupled together, right? Uh, asynchronously coupled together. And there are multiple ways of doing this. So you could use gRPC, or you could use service bus. So there are a bunch of patterns, uh, like we ca call coordinator pattern or uh, choreography pattern. Coordinator pattern is generally used when, you know, Microservice A has to interact with microservice B, get its result, and then pass it along to microservice C. So some sort of chaining pattern, you know, generally done by a coordinator microservice. So we don't have any of that. We have choreography, which means every application publishes its events to the event stream, service bus, basically. It, so diagram got created, that gets pushed into service bus. Now, diagram got created. What should happen next? I should create a thumbnail out of it. The thumbnail is handled by the other microservice. So the thumbnail creator is listening to the service bus for that event. And uh, uh, as soon as it sees that a diagram got created, it will go ahead and uh, you know, uh, it has basically a service bus triggered function that will wake up and it will generate the thumbnail for it. So service bus is uh, used very heavily. It, it's our event stream, basically. So uh, advantages of using Azure Service Bus, dead lettering, poison messages, uh, auto-scaled competing com consumers, right? So uh, when you have a burst of requests, let's say 50,000 requests came in one second, uh, I can scale out my listeners. So I can drain out the queue very fast uh, you know, by just by uh, having multiple consumers there. So that is an advantage of Service Bus. And if you tether service bus to Azure Functions, it makes it a pretty much a no-op. It's basically taken care of by the uh, uh, Azure Functions infrastructure for you. 
Right? So it can scale up to 32 listeners per service bus per app, if I recall this correctly. And things like retries, backoffs, timeouts, circuit breakers, they have policies for all of those. You can use poly, you can use, uh, you know, like I think Azure Functions now has a built-in policy layer as well uh, that you can you just write with annotations or attributes. So those things make it, uh, you know, uh, implementing all those things like backoffs become super simple. All right. Um, yeah, so one of the things about uh, when you are using that queue-based load, lev load leveling pattern, you know, uh, it's your write commits are not going to happen immediately. Uh, there's going to be some uh, lag there, so you have to be okay with eventual consistency. All right, microservices have to be stateless. So stateless means, you know, uh, we always live under the assumption that microservices can be restarted, redeployed at any point in time. You can have an application update uh, coming in at any point in time. So it can't maintain state in memory. Every uh, state that uh, has to be flushed to a persistent store, a repository, basically. So don't uh, stuff, uh, save stuff in memory. Uh, persist in caches or in DBs. Um, don't use sticky session and affinities because this will prevent, uh, this will be a barrier when you horizontally auto scale out. So if you have something, uh, one instance that is affinitized to one client, that is going to uh, impede your horizontal auto scale out. The goal of auto scale out is an incoming request should be handled by any one of the auto scaled out instance. So do not affinitize uh, something back to an orig uh, originating client. Okay, scaling types, we've seen this in Azure. Uh, so there is a slider scale for uh, uh, app services. So this happens at the app service plan level. There is schedule scaling which says, hey, uh, my application tends to be used very heavily between 9, uh, 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. So when it hits 9 a.m., I scale it out. When it hits 9, uh, 5 p.m., I scale it back in. So you can do schedule scaling. You can do rule-based scaling as well. So when the rate of incoming requests goes beyond some threshold, scale it out. Uh, when the message queue size goes beyond something, scale it out. So all those things are possible. Uh, they're all JSON-based expressions, so it's very easy to do that. Or just go with Azure Functions. Use the uh, you know, event-driven auto-scaling. The, uh, let the scale controller decide how to scale it, and you step out of the picture. And this is what we prefer, right? The whole goal of serverless is I don't want to be in the business of uh, you know, figuring out scaling rules. Let the scale controller decide that. And it's doing a good enough job. Observability, um, again, like I said, serverless, no server to SSH into. So something goes wrong, logs have to be there. So uh, one of the things we do is uh, log levels, right? So log level is set to information by, uh, or uh, uh, information by default. But if you need to uh, do some additional logging, all you have to do is like change a key vault value and just restart the application. And then it will pick up that configuration value and then start spitting out uh, more verbose logs. Uh, but a lot of user metrics are being tracked. So if you search for a specific icon, let's say uh, Azure container apps in the diagram editor and you don't find it, uh, if it returns zero, then we actually generate a custom event saying that, hey, this particular icon was not found. Then it, uh, you know, uh, behind the scenes, we are actually analyzing the telemetry, and we go ahead and add that icon into our repository. Okay. Um, system metrics, again, bunch of components, right? Service bus, there is uh, SQL DB, Cosmos DB. Each of them comes with their own pa you know, uh, parameters or metrics of interest. So if it's a service bus, then it is uh, you know, number of dead-lettered messages. If it is uh, SQL, then the, it's the DTU utilization. If it's Cosmos DB, then uh, normalized RU. So bunch of metrics. So depending upon what uh, pass service you're using, you have to observe the metric. And you have to set uh, what you call as yellow and red thresholds. So yellow is a warning, red is critical. Right? At red, somebody has to intervene. So it's basically it's like filing a pager duty ticket. So uh, we use Azure portal uh, dashboard to visualize all this. And then we also have uh, alerts set. So when you know, DTU utilization goes beyond 80%, I get an alert on Slack and an email. Uh, no manual intervention. Always use service accounts. So um, the whole goal is to keep your dev and test identical. So you should always use service accounts and not uh, you know, manually test it out. Uh, no manual access to prod, so um, always use verbose logging. So if something goes wrong, you know what's going on. 
dev test prod parity again. Uh, we use the same, we use Terraform to set up all the inf uh, infrastructure that you saw there. Uh, the same provi provisioning script is used to set up dev, test, and prod. The only difference between them is that the key vault configuration, uh, like the, uh, the key names remain the same, the values differ. Right? All right. Now comes this uh, thing called uh, throttling and debouncing, right? So I've turned on autosave on the diagram. So let's say you do something like you drag an icon across the canvas. Now the x, y coordinates are changing, 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 changing. And there are like a million times it changes before you uh, slide over to the other side. Do you really want to send a million calls to the server? You don't. So that is where you use a technique called debouncing, which is you wait, so this is a principle borrowed from electronics. Um, you wait for the signal to come down and you know settle, and then the final value is what you send to the server side. So that's debouncing. On the flip side, uh, rate limiting is something that we do on the server side. Uh, so debouncing on uh, client side, rate limiting on server side. So if the number of incoming requests exceeds some threshold, then you want to say, hey, back off a little bit, try uh, later, so it's like a 429 error in Cosmos DB, for example. Okay. Queue-based load leveling we already talked about. So just uh, put everything into a queue and dequeue in batches, and the batch size should be such that the database can handle it. Uh, we use Brotli compression for everything. Uh, we use middleware in the ASP.NET Core pipeline, so Brotli compression is enabled. So all the JSON responses are uh, compressed to 40% of their original size. CDN, again, caching, compression, manage TLS certs, URL rewriting rules to set the cache headers, all those things are set up. And uh, we use Auth0 for uh, all the identity and access management. Okay, uh, We use the authorization code grant. And uh, one final slide. So what's next, right? So right now, CloudSQ is deployed only to one region, which is West Europe, right? It's just a small product, but we want to scale it out globally. So high availability will become a concern at some point in time. It's not yet a concern, but it will become a concern at some point in time. So at that point, we have to worry about things like traffic manager, front door. Don't have that problem yet, but at some point, we will. Other thing is uh, pushing to prod. You want to push out the application in a warm state. So you want to use things like slot uh, swapping. So uh, that's not available with the B1 SKU that I'm using in app service right now. Um, Backend APIs, we are not caching anything right now. So uh, there can be an optimization added uh, with uh, Redis cache. And then uh, other things like there are a lot of experimental features that uh, I want to put in. Uh, and I don't want to deploy them immediately to all users. So I want to do a staggered or you know, blue-green deployment and then enable feature flags also. So uh, that's in the pipeline. And then internally, we want to use a Grafana or Power BI dashboard to track all our internal metrics. Whew. And I think we are done. Thank you all.